Hello, my name is David Smith and for the moment at least I'm the head of the English Interpreting Unit in the European Commission here in Brussels. But as I'm planning to retire in two months time, Lourdes suggested that it might be a moment to look back on my career and see what sort of things have changed over the years. I joined the uh, Commission in 1977, which seems a very long time ago now. And it was just after the United Kingdom and Ireland had joined the European community, as it then was, of course. They were desperate for interpreters at the time, which is probably why they recruited me. I'm not sure they were, we can say they were scraping the barrel, but they were fairly low down. We um, worked rather differently in those days. There were only two people in every booth, in any meeting. There were only six languages being spoken in any case, the dominant one being French. And it was the French booth that was castigated at that time for not ever doing anything. The lazy people who sat around while everybody else did the work. That's changed a little, of course, in the meantime, as we know. The working hours weren't quite so well defined as they are now. We did insist on a one and a half hour lunch break, that's true. But there wasn't really an end time on meetings and they would drag on till seven or eight or in the case of an agricultural council, sometimes all night. You might start at 10 o'clock in the morning and not finish until the croissant were brought in the next morning at eight o'clock. It's quite remarkable that we've managed to get working conditions introduced that have allowed us to follow a more humane regime, I think. The sort of topics we talked about were quite different from the ones we talk about today as well, or rather, we should say there were rather fewer of them. We talked a lot about customs legislation and an awful lot about agriculture. In fact, as long as you knew something about intervention and sluice gate prices, you didn't have to uh, have too broad a general knowledge at all. But slowly, the sort of uh, things we talked about expanded and we found ourselves moving into all sorts of different areas. I myself was a steel specialist. Other people were coal specialists. My job involved me wandering around steelworks, trying to explain the workings to a group of interested English uh, steel experts above the noise of uh, steam hammers and rolling mills. Others, as I say, went down coal mines. I tried it once, I must say, I didn't like it. And I liked it even less when I heard the story of one of our friends who was riding on a coal train, got frightened, froze, and was only saved at the last minute by one of the coal miners themselves, dragging him off the train before he found his way into the crusher. What else did we do? Well, we did do a lot of agriculture. We uh, might find ourselves standing in a field of cabbages or potatoes at seven o'clock on a very wet morning in the Netherlands for comparative field trials, or even, in one case, a field of four-leaf clover. On other occasions, I found myself flying down the Rhine in a German army helicopter owned by GSG 9, the anti-terrorist group, uh, which uh, went into action in Mogadishu. Or travelling the world. I must say, I have seen an awful lot of the world over the years, thanks to working as an interpreter. I've visited, I think, every European country, including some not in the European Union. I've been to Russia, I've been to Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, South America, several trips to Tokyo and Kyoto, and even one memorable trip, memorable trip to, to Western Samoa, which was, I should think, probably the best mission I've ever done. The great thing about the early days was, I think, the feeling of being part of a team, especially in consecutive meetings. If there was something you didn't know, you asked. You were treated as somebody who was not infallible, who could make mistakes but was willing to learn. It was uh, a different way 
of perceiving the work of the interpreter. He was there as part of the team, helping the general effort, helping people to communicate. And that, I think, is something which has changed over the years. It's changed, I think, as the European Union has grown and as the number of languages has grown and the way in which the work of the interpreter is perceived. We didn't see any very great change after the accession of Greece, Portugal, Spain, but when Sweden, Austria and Finland joined, we saw the beginnings of the shift towards the use of English rather than French. The great sea change, though, came in 2004 with the, the Big Bang enlargement, with 10 new countries joining the Union, when suddenly English became the predominant language. But English, not as we know it. What we call BSE, or badly spoken English. It grates on our ears. It drives people in other booths mad. But on the other hand, we've had to learn to accept that this is how things are. It's not something we can change. And while our working conditions generally have improved, we've got limits on the hours we can work, we, are, we have rules about um, how many sessions we can do in a week, we've got all sorts of documentation uh, facilities which we never had before, resources which we only dreamed of in the early days. Somehow the quality of the work we do now has changed. We feel sometimes we're perhaps almost ornamental. We're being put in there for political reasons that we don't really, in every meeting, play that important role as a communicator. I personally think that's more a perception than a reality. I think there are a lot of meetings where we're still very much needed and we're still very much appreciated. And I really do think that there is a future for this profession and that we will go on needing people who know languages and who can help other people talk to each other for many years to come. As I say, I think there is a future for this uh, profession, but on one condition, and that is that we really provide high quality. I remember a colleague of mine, a former head of the Danish unit, saying to me once, the Danes already understand 96% of the English they hear. Unless we can supply the other 4%, they're not going to bother with us. They'll listen to the English direct. And I think you can apply that mutatis mutandis to all the interpreting we do here. Unless we can demonstrate that we are measurably better than the people listening to us in our linguistic skills, then we will be out of a job. I've got confidence that we can do that. When I see the young people coming into the profession today, the dedication they have, the amount of work they put into preparing meetings, the sheer level of their linguistic abilities, yes, I've got every confidence in the future.